But I want it today. I'm going to jump into the word. I'm not going to give you my title. I'm just going to kind of set it up first. Um, but how many of you, I think all of us can agree with this, but that the majority of us have an idea of what we think God should do or how he should do it. How many of you, you know, you know, you, it's like, okay, God, this is a, a need right here. And, and I think you should do this. And this is how you should do that. And it's in what happens is, is if, if not with our life individually at a minimum, what we think God should do with other people, where we just stop and say, Lord, you just need to take care of that person and you need to kind of straighten that situation out or areas or, or situations that we're facing is we have an idea of what God should do in the way that he should do it. And it, but the thing is, is that that's good if we have God's perspective in our, and in our situation, we've got his word in that, and we're trusting and know that he has our best at heart. Is it, but if we come up with it, God, this is what I think you should do, and this is the way I think you should do it, but we don't have his perspective, or maybe we don't have his word, and we're not trusting that he has our best at heart, we get frustrated with life. And what it is in the, the if part is hard because we're usually so close to the fire that we have an opinion. We have an opinion because we're, we're close to the fire. And you know, I want to just throw this thought out there. Did you know that the 12 apostles were exactly the same way? They were the same way. Is that if you study what you find out about them, is that they, were, um, they had a militaristic mindset and what it was is that when the Messiah came, which they believed was Jesus, he was going to overthrow Rome and reestablish Israel as the prominent uh, force on the earth, like when David was the king. And so they would make statements over and over again, and that when, when the Messiah would come and he would reestablish the kingdom, all of their problems would be gone. They would no longer, you know, if you look, is that they would be leading the world. And if you study, what you find out is the disciples had this perspective of when Jesus does this, that we 12 are going to be with him ruling. And you remember the story uh, when James, James and John's mother came to Jesus and said, hey, when your kingdom comes into fruition, I want you to give my sons to sit on your right and your left. And her perspective was that Jesus was going to be overthrowing Rome and that her sons were going to be uh-huh and uh-huh. They were going to be like right, right up there. And that if you, if you look, that's why when Jesus began to share about his death with the disciples is they freaked out. And at one point, if you look, what you find out is Peter pulls Jesus aside and he rebukes him and tells Jesus that your take on what you said is going to happen is not going to happen. And Jesus, let me set you straight. How many of you know when you do that with Jesus, you got problems? You got problems. And that's what Peter did. And throughout Jesus' ministry, it just kept resurfacing over and over and over. And what it was, is it was a mentality of God, get me out of this, change this situation, fix it in a miraculous, supernatural way. And that's the only way that I'm thinking. And I want to look at an encounter that Jesus had after his crucifixion and resurrection in Acts chapter 1. It says this in Acts 1. It says, During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Now you remember their mindset of the kingdom of God was a natural kingdom being set up on the earth. And so Jesus is talking to them over and over about this in verse 4. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them 
Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, verse 5, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want you to just, if you want a point of reference for this, is I would encourage you to read John 14, 15, and 16, because the promise of the Holy Spirit was given to all believers, and he hadn't been poured out yet. And so Jesus, Jesus basically said, you need to wait for that. Now look at verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, now look at this statement, they kept asking him. Now, when you think of the word kept asking him, I think of when my children were young and they wanted something and they just kept asking. They just kept, can I have it? Can I have it? Or here's one. Are we there yet? When are we going to get there? How much longer? I got to go to the bathroom. How many of you know? It was just like, over. Oh, it says that they kept asking him. Now look at what they kept asking him. Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? They're still there. They're still at this spot that Jesus tried to tell them way back that, you know what, it's not going to be how you think. They're still in their mindset is now the time. Now look at what Jesus said, and I want us to get this. He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power. Say that with me. Everybody say power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. What I want you to notice is this. As they said, Lord, when are you going to change this natural world as we see it and as we know it? And he looks at them and he said, it's not for you to know when God has planned to do that. But what you need to realize is that the Holy Spirit will give you power in your here and in your now. And God wants you to focus on the Holy Spirit's ability in you. And what he will do is he will so transform your life that you used to be freaking out and running from all of this stuff. He'll so transform your life that you will be a witness. He didn't say you would go witnessing. He said it, he would so transform you the way that you think and the way that you function he said that you would be a witness and then he said because you're a witness it would explode and go from Jerusalem Judea Samaria and to the other mo uttermost parts look at verse 9 after saying this he was taken up into the cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him as they strained to see him rising into heaven Two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him. What I want you to notice is Jesus directly adjusted the mindset of God, get me out of here fix this the way I think you should fix it. This is what I think you should do. This is the way I think you should do it. And Jesus immediately spoke to that and said, the Holy Spirit is going to come into your life and he's going to so transform you on the inside. So change you on the inside. And what I want to teach on, and this is my title today, is stop, drop, and roll. You say, well, that's a fire term. I know it is. <laughs> I know I've actually personally experienced that in my life. And this is no, I'm not minimizing. If you've had an experience where you had to do that, I had that in my life. But, but what it is, is in the context of what we're talking about, is stop, is I believe God is saying, I want you to think, assess, and ask, 
Am I trusting God right now in the season that I'm in? Right now, stop. Right now, you say right now, it's, life's not gone the way I thought. It didn't go this way. I have my opinion. God says, I want you to stop right now. And what I want you to do is to think and assess, am I trusting God with my life right now? Drop the way that you thought it had to go or was going to go. Just drop it and say, you know what, God? I'm going to trust you. And the third thing, or the third word was roll, is be willing to roll with a mind that is set on, God's got this, and I'm willing to follow him. God, you've got this. I'm going to stop, and I'm going to assess, am I trusting the Lord right now? Am I trusting him with my life right now? I'm going to drop, okay, I thought it was going to go this way. This is what I had planned. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a plan, but it didn't go just like them, exactly the way they thought it should go. And God is saying, just like Jesus, uh, when he spoke to them, he said, are you willing to roll with this? Are you going to roll with a mind that is set on God's got this, and I'm willing to follow him? And I want to be clear, is God does, and I've seen it over and over again, he does things miraculously and supernaturally. And there are times that he just delivers us out of things. He just, in, his, in, a, in a way that just blows our mind, and we're just standing there like, wow, God, that was awesome. But he also strengthens us to go through things that develop us in areas that affect us being able to handle what he's got for our life tomorrow. See, we've got to realize that their mindset is God rapture me out now. I only believe in the God that just is supernatural, just instantaneous, just totally transforms. I'm not minimizing. We need to have that kind of faith. But we equally, what Jesus spoke to them is he talked about the Holy Spirit coming into them and strengthening them. Then it, and what was going to happen is, is the Holy Spirit in them and through the things that they were facing is he was going to develop them in areas that were going to affect them being able to handle what God had for them tomorrow. See, what it is, is we don't like it, but he, but what it is, is he's God and he knows what's best. And we got to be people of faith. We got to just stop and say, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to trust you right now. And I want to be clear. God does both. God does both in our life. I mean, I wish that he would kind of set a line. Line one is instantaneous. And line two is I'm going to give you power and ability and walk you through. And you're going to be such a witness that it's going to transform other people's lives. Is that this one is much harder than this one is. And he does both. But what it is, is what happens is that if my view of him is only, God, I'll only embrace you in a rapture me out of this mentality. Lord, I'll only embrace you. Is this the time? I won't embrace his plan of development for my life and I'll live frustrated. I'll live frustrated. God knew where they were. He knew the pressures that they were facing. He knew all about Rome. He knew all about the oppression. He knew all about the injustices. He knew all about that. And look at and what I love about it is he said, you know what? I'm going to transform this, but I need you to do it my way. I need you to embrace me right where you're at. Walk it out right where you're at. I want to look at a passage in Hebrews that talks about Jesus and why he was made in a body like we have. Look at what it says in Hebrews 2 verse 17. It says, therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and his sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Notice, Jesus was made in a body like we have so that he could be merciful and faithful. He can relate as a high priest. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Now look at verse 18. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Jesus was made in a body like we have so that when we're going through stuff, he can relate. He understands and he gets it. 
He was made in a body so that he could be tempted and tested and tried like we are. See, but if, if their mindset or the 12 that we're talking about only embraced the God that gets me out and not the God that will strengthen me in this and grow through this, understand they would never be able to do what God had called them to do. And I believe that where, where, you know, what I'm facing can serve a bigger purpose in my life than just God get me out of this. It could serve a bigger purpose in my life than God get me out. See, God will use this to equip me for what he has planned for my life tomorrow, and he will use my example of what I'm going through or what I'm facing to help somebody else, and they'll see it, and they'll be like, oh my gosh. See, uh, what we've got to realize is that God wants us to enjoy the journey more than the destination. He wants us to because life is in the journey. Life is about 99% journey and 1% destination. And if we don't watch it, what we do is we live for the destination rather than live for walking with the Lord through the journey of life. And that God is wanting us to make an adjustment. See, the journey is where growth occurs. The journey is where development occurs. The journey is where life is at. And it's having a heart that leads with a stomach for whatever. Lord, I'm going to let you lead. I'm going to stay true in my heart. And I need to develop a stomach that whatever gets thrown at me, I'm not going to give in to the what's going on around me. But God, I know and I trust that you've got me. I mean, I want to just throw a picture out there. Could you picture Satan when he, when before mankind was created, he was in heaven and he said, I'm going to exalt my throne above God's. Satan was a created being that had a will and he used it to directly go against God. And now God creates mankind, puts him on the earth, gives him a will, knowing he was, man was going to sin. Ephesians 1 tells us, sins a redeemer. And now the enemy watches as we put Satan under our feet because of what Jesus did. It's amazing to me, God's plan. It's amazing. And I want to give us four thoughts in regard to stop, drop, and roll. Number one is this. Don't let your head override your heart. Don't let your head, by all means, have a plan. The Bible talks about that. Don't be vague or thoughtless or foolish, but firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. Is God doesn't, He wants us, we should have a plan, but don't trust in your plan, trust in God. Stop and say, God, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna trust in you. Trust in God, His love and his goodness. Because understand, your plan is never going to go the way you think it's going to go. But what will stabilize you is trusting in God's love and trusting in God's goodness when it doesn't, that he's navigating and he's leading. Proverbs, just an anchor scripture, Proverbs 3, verse 5 through verse 6 says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Look at the statement, which path to take. Lord, I planned this path, but it didn't. But you're going to show me which path to take. Another just a, a anchor scripture is in, in Matthew 6, verse 25, where Jesus is talking. And he said, that is why I tell you, do not worry about everyday life whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. And then he said this, isn't life more than food in your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They do not plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. Or, now look at this statement. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Number two is this is God wants to build a supernatural confidence on the inside of me. He wants to build it. He wants to build a supernatural confidence in me. 
in us. You say, well, what do you mean by that? There's two levels of confidence. There's two levels. There's a natural confidence, and there's nothing wrong with natural confidence, that comes from us being able to figure things out, and maybe our natural life is agreeable, and everything is kind of going, and so it produces a confidence on the inside. And I want to be clear, there's nothing wrong with that. But that is what I'm going to call surface confidence because all it takes is a little rock and that thing goes sideways and with it goes our confidence, our peace, our our optimism, our outlook, and our joy. But then there is a spiritual or what I'm going to call a supernatural confidence and what that is, is it's supernatural in nature. You say, what do you mean by supernatural? Natural is based on natural, supernatural is rooted in something deeper than natural. It's rooted in something deeper than maybe what I'm, I'm looking at. And it's a confidence that gives me the ability to rest and to have peace when everything natural isn't going okay. It's not going okay, but I have a peace. I have a rest. I'm able to go to sleep. I'm able to trust. I don't kick the dog every morning. How many of you know what I'm saying? I don't get up and just be like, "Ah," you know, and what it is. And and please, this is not in any way meant to be a judgmental thing. This is not to be a gotcha moment or anything. But I believe that right now, you know, as we've gone through this corona thing and some of the unrest right now that's happening in in our our nation due to um, discrimination and, and brutality and just some of the different things that are happening, I believe that God is saying to his people, I want you to lead, but I want you to lead from a position of supernatural peace where you are not just caught up in the flare of the moment and, and just and it just offended and just up to all of that, but I need, I need my people to lead in this time. You know, Paul said that I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. And I want to just read in Philippians 4, verse 10. Paul said, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. Think about that statement. If you look, what you find out is Paul has, the Philippian church has provided for his needs more than any other church. They would, when he was out on the missionary trail with his team, they would send ahead and provide for his needs. And there were times we're going to see that he was tight, but look at what he said when their provision came in, he recognized who brought it in And he said, God, I see you as the provider for my need. Look at that. He said, I praise the Lord that you have, that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need. Now look at this statement. For I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. That is supernatural. Verse 12. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation. I'm going to throw this out. Every season, every situation, and everything we face. Whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. Verse 13. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. The Amplified says it like this. Jesus infuses us with inner strength on the inside. And so I want to just encourage us today that God right now wants to build. We talked about stop, drop, and roll. Maybe you're looking and you're like the apostles and you're saying, hey, I thought this, I thought this, I thought this. And Jesus is saying, I got this. I need you to stop, drop, and roll. Number three is this, is love your lane. Say, what do you mean, love your lane? Some people are never happy because they're always looking at everybody else's lane. They're always looking at everybody else's life. They're always comparing themselves to somebody else rather than trusting and believing that God has given them and has a specific plan for their life just as unique 
as their fingerprint. And they would never be happy being anybody other than who God made them to be. And to be able to just stop and say, you know what, I just need to be content and happy in my lane. I need to just stop comparing myself among everybody else. See, God's giftings and plan for each person is unique for each and every person. And what it is, is yes, we can look and we can learn at others, but be happy with the way that God made you. God loves me. He has a plan for me and understand I'm good with that. I'm good. I don't need to look at everybody else. Well, look at this person. We'll look at that person. We'll look what they're driving. We'll look at their situation. We'll look at their kids. We'll look at their wife. We'll look at who they're dating. Look at, just stop and say, you know what? God's got me. And I'm going to love my lane where I'm at. And what I'm not going to do is that when maybe things don't go the way I think, where well, I'm going to start comparing myself to everybody else and just stop and say, God, you love me uniquely and you've got me uniquely. Look at what it says in Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, therefore then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth. I'm going to stop for just a moment and realize when he said that, he is referring to the entire 11th chapter of all of the heroes of faith. He's lifted men, women, everybody. I mean, Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, there's everybody. He said, since you are surrounded by all of those people who they're witnesses and they've borne testimony to the truth, look at what he said. Let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us. And let us run with patient endurance and steady, active, persistent, the appointed course of the race that is set before us. God said, hey, come after me. Trust me. I need you to not be looking around at everybody else. I need you to cultivate steady, active, persistence and what I'm doing in you and understand I'm the difference. I'm just going to throw this out here. What would have happened if David would have got all caught up in comparing himself with other people? He had never been who God made him to be. What about Joseph? 21 years in prison. If he would have got all into the offended and comparing and looking at everybody else and saying, I did what God wanted me to do and look what it got me and look where I'm at and look what happened in my life. He'd have never been the prime minister of Egypt and fulfill the call that God had on his life. It doesn't matter who you look at in the Bible is God is saying, I got, I've got a plan for you. Now look at what it says in verse two. Looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive for our belief, and is also its finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. Who's going to bring my faith to maturity and perfection? It's Jesus. As I identify God, this is my race. I'm going to look away from everything that distracts. I'm going to be, I'm going to be consistent and persistent and steady in you. God said, I'll bring you there. And is also the finisher, bring it to maturity and perfection. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross. There's the bummer. That's the hardship. Despising and ignoring the shame and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I just want to, with three, third point, steady, active persistence in your race. What's your race right now? What do you know God's gifted me to do this? Maybe you're here and you just say, gosh, I'm home with my kids. And I'm just like, God, what am I doing? I want to tell you something. You are at the right place at the right time. Steady, active persistence in that. Maybe you're here. You're, maybe you're at a spot and 
you lost your job and you're doing something that you maybe don't want to do or whatever, whatever, but it's meeting the need. I want to encourage you, that was Joseph. That was David. Steady, active persistence, the race that you're at right now, what God's got for you. He's big enough and he wants you to trust him. And the last one, number four, is this, is have a 10,000 foot view. Have a 10,000. You know, everything looks different with altitude. It all looks different with altitude. Several years back, my wife didn't kidnap me, but she, I like her to kidnap me, but anyway, is, um, but she was, she, for my birthday, she got my, uh, my kids together and arranged, and she, I don't know how she did this, because you, my wife, in case you didn't know, she cannot lie. She can't lie. She can't. And you say, how do you know? Because I've been married to her for 37 years. All you have to do is look at her and ask her a question. You just look at her and, and if you guess or you think you guess, she cannot. She'll just be, I got to go. I got to go. You know what I'm saying? And she uh, arranged all of us to go skydiving. And so we, and I, this is the first time I think in my life that she's been able to do that and me not figure it out. And I'm guessing. And on the way there, I'm like, this is a bike ride. This is a this, this is a that, this is a this. And we're going down there. And I said, are you taking a skydiving in the car about 10 minutes before we get there? And she's like, oh no, no, no. And I'm like, okay, I got it. We're going skydiving. <laughs> But what it is, is that at 10,000 feet, everything looks different. It looks different. You see things you never saw before. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Oh wow. You, and it's just like a surreal moment. See, what happens is, is God wants us to have a 10,000 foot view versus it just down here looking what's right in front of us. In his word, gives us a 10,000 foot view. Colossians 3 verse 1 through verse 4 says this, since you have been raised to a new life with Christ. Notice that is past tense. It's already happened. Now look at what he said. Set your sights on the, now look at this, the realities, plural, of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Look at the statement there, set your sights on the realities of heaven. What are the realities of heaven? The realities of heaven are the promises of God for your life. They're the realities. Notice he didn't say the reality of going to heaven. He said the realities, plural, of heaven. What is God speaking in and over your life. It's what are the promises that he's given you. Look at verse 2. Think about the things of heaven. There it is, plural again. Things of heaven, not the things of the earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. See, we as Christians were never intended to live without faith affecting our view. We were never intended to go one minute without trust in God. We were never intended. That's the fallen world. And what we've got to do is maybe in these uncertain times right now, you need to assess and you need to say, right now, in, am I stopping, dropping, and rolling? Right now, am I stopping and thinking and assess, am I trusting God right now with my life? Okay, this just happened. That just happened. I didn't plan for this. I didn't like this. This is hard. This is difficult. I need to stop right now, and I need to say, is there anything that is trying to erode or undermine my faith in God? And I need to stop right now and assess that myself. Next is I need to drop maybe the way that I thought 
it was going to go or it had to go. And I just need to say, God, I had this plan. I thought it was going to go that way. It hasn't gone that way. But what I know is I'm going to stop and I'm not going to just continue like the 12 apostles. Is this the time? You're going to do it now? Like your kids in the car. Are we there yet? 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 God's like, just drop it. Just drop it right now. Just right, right now, you just need to stop and say, I know where you're at. I got you. I want you to trust. And the next thing is roll. Be willing to roll with a mind that is set on God. You've got this, and I'm willing to follow you. Right where I'm at. Right what's going on. I want to today challenge you're tuning in online in your living room. Right now, the presence of God is there. And I believe he's wanting to make a little shift on the inside of us. Maybe in particular, you said, gosh, I've been through some things. I've been facing some things, and it's been hard. Please understand, our heart goes out, and um, our prayers go out, and, and we're sorry. And we just want to be there and help you. But I believe right now, God is wanting a shift. And what he's saying is, is he's saying, make the adjustment. Maybe you're there, and you say, you know, I realize that that's the adjustment I need to make. Or maybe you're tuning in, and you've never given your heart to Christ or you are just like something took your feet out from underneath you and you have just kind of given up on God and right now is a moment for you to just stop and say okay God I was believing in you when I could manipulate and you're wanting me to come to a spot where I can't manipulate but I trust you regardless I want to lead us all in a prayer and I want us all to just pray this with me Say this with me. Jesus, I believe in your love, in your goodness. Your word tells me that while I was yet a sinner, didn't even know you, Jesus, you died for me. And I need you. And I'm asking you, Come into my heart. Come into my life. Help me, God. I give you my past. I'm asking you to help me. Help me in navigating my present in a way that honors you. And I'm going to trust you with my future. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, Road to Life, we want to encourage you. If you prayed that prayer, or maybe you made a decision to follow the Lord today and you're just looking for a practical direction, um, to text the word LIFE, 269-924-0909. Once again, that number is 269-924-0909, and that word is LIFE. Um, you can actually use that database for anything if you want to give. Um, you can text that number 269-924-0909 with the keyword give. There's a bunch of different things that you can use for that. If you have any questions about the services next week, um, we're really excited for that. Um, you also reach out to us or or follow us on our, our social media pages and, and uh, let us know if you kind of have any questions or anything. But with that, we are so excited. Next week, 8.30, 10, and 11.30. We want to encourage you, come on out. And don't forget this week, right? Evaluate your life. What do you maybe need to stop? What do you need to maybe drop? And what do you need to maybe roll with the Lord with? And we're with you. We're praying for you. We miss you. But boy, are we excited to see you next week. We love you so much. And we hope you have a great Sunday. See you later, Road to Life.